Designed, Deconstructed, Mental Health and Wellness with Dr. Kaz and George. The statements of Dr. Kaz and George are not a substitute for medical care, and our opinions are our own. If you are experiencing a mental health emergency, please seek assistance from a professional in your area. You can contact us via Twitter at Mind Deconstruct. I'm your host, George. With me is Dr. Kaz. Dr. Kaz Nelson is an American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology Certified Psychiatrist, licensed to practice medicine in the state of Minnesota, and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota Medical School. On today's episode, Mental Illness and Pregnancy. Now, Dr. Kaz, our topic today came from our Facebook page where you put out a poll asking what should be the next topic. Yeah, our Mind Deconstructed podcast group, which is open to anybody. Feel free to join and you'll get notifications on Facebook for when we post things to the group site, including new episodes. But there was a lot of interest in this topic, mental illness and pregnancy. This was an idea of one of the Facebook group members and other people liked it. So I'm very grateful to have this suggested so we can talk about it today. This tied with the topic alcohol use and misuse. So we'll aim to cover that next time. So for our hot topic in mental health, our researchers from Stanford University recently conducted a study published in the American Economic Review to determine the effect that a family member's death may have on children, the child that they're currently carrying. Is that what that's telling me? They looked at Swedish infants who were born between 1973 and 2011, whose mother had lost a close relative during pregnancy and then followed those children through to adulthood. And what did they determine? Well, they found that exposure prenatally, meaning in the uterus of the mother, exposure to a death of a maternal relative increased the rates that children would be on medications for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD, or anti-anxiety or antidepressant medications in adulthood after following the children over years. That's interesting, but it doesn't really seem like something that a pregnant person can really control. Of course not. The researchers made clear in their statement that they said, of course you cannot prevent family members from dying, and we certainly don't want our findings to constitute yet another source of stress for expecting mothers, but they wanted to highlight the idea that stress can impact health of children and future adults, and even in the prenatal period and that perhaps there should be more resources and social support for pregnant women, especially those who may be experiencing poverty or other economic factors. This was a Swedish study. The Scandinavians try to do a pretty good job with their pregnant folk. They do, and they have this national database that allows this type of long-term research over decades, in addition to databases of conditions that are diagnosed and medications that are prescribed. And so a lot of the epidemiological data actually comes from those Scandinavian countries. So for today, talking about pregnancy and mental health, what's different about pregnancy that it gets its own category of mental health topic? Why are we talking about it? When it comes to families and reproductive health questions, they tend to impact one's life significantly. Family planning issues, working on conceiving issues, those really just cannot be underestimated. Challenges to conception or even challenges related to pregnancy can really impact people in ways that they don't necessarily even predict. So is it just about the unknown? You know, it's hard to get pregnant, it's stressful being pregnant. Or you may be pregnant unexpectedly, yeah, it goes both ways. Unplanned pregnancy, Mm -hmm. which is still possibly another source of stress or strain. Mm -hmm. Is that it? There's those types of psychological or social factors. There can be financial stress as you're looking to plan for providing for a child and caring for a child. And then there's also some pretty significant biological or body-based changes, including hormones. That's what I was wondering. I mean, because there's large amounts of hormones that your body's not used to. That's right. And some women have minimal impact related to those hormones and others are more vulnerable to mood or other well-being issues related to those rapid hormone changes. And so it's something to be aware of and to get some education in advance in case additional help or services are needed. So what are we talking about? What sort of mental health concerns pop up for the pregnant population? One of 
most common issues men and women face, actually, after the birth of a child is something that we would commonly call the baby blues. And that's almost universal change in mood or increase in anxiety that has to do with the impact of having a new baby. (laughs) They're not the easiest to care for. The lack of sleep that comes with feeding an infant every few hours. Is baby blues different than postpartum depression? Yeah, I think there's an important distinction to make there. And I hope that that's one of the things that people can understand after this is that baby blues is almost universal and it represents a challenge, but people can also have a greater degree of depression or anxiety where it actually leads to a lot of dysfunction or problems. And that might be more in the realm of major depression or a major anxiety disorder that can come along in this vulnerable period of time. So what do you recommend for baby blues? I mean, you said it's almost universal, so almost everyone's going through that, which is interesting to me because there's a lot of stress involved with having a baby, but also it's, you know, supposed to be this joyous time. You've got your new bundle of joy and all of those great things. Yeah, I think there's this perception that it's a joyful time. And uh, those who have been through it also know that, it's not that easy and can be a real challenge. Of course, in many instances, it's wonderful to bring a new family member into the into the household. But I think sometimes people will actually feel shame if they're feeling tired or, gosh, should we have really done this? I'm not sure if I can do it. And if you have this conception that it's supposed to be blissful or joyful all the time, and then you end up feeling crappy, that can lead to even more shame, which can worsen well-being kinds of issues. You don't have to hide the hard parts. You can live your life with your new baby and it can be hard and you can be okay that it's not all great and that, you know, there are times where that's going to affect you negatively. Yeah. Knowledge that people universally find this challenging, taking care of yourself, uh, relying on your support network if if you have one, uh, relying on medical services or mental health services or community-based services to support the period of time following pregnancy, those are all possible things people can do to ensure that they're getting support through what's a challenging time. Are hormones still a part of the baby blues? Yeah, I think you can't really separate the hormones because at the time of birth, there's yet another influx of all sorts of different hormones that go along with lactation and the post-birth period. And so you can't really separate the hormones out of the picture but people have varying degree of challenges related to those hormonal changes. Okay. Looking at the bigger issues, Mm -hmm. um, what would you say are some of the the more serious mental health concerns that women could be facing? So like I mentioned, very common is the baby blues, and then still very common, major depression or serious anxiety. And that's similar to topics we've discussed in other podcasts, but in that after the birth of the baby period and associated with really significant non-well-being, lack of interest, lack of self-care, tearfulness, sadness, even sometimes suicide thoughts. And so those are really important to identify if they're there. It can be high risk. Is postpartum depression a separate diagnosis than major depression? The criteria are very similar, but we like to identify it separately if it is that postpartum period because we want to take that into the understanding of what's going on. Is it in some way more treatable or anything like that? I would say that there are some different treatment challenges, but I wouldn't say that it's more or less treatable. Okay. So what what else besides depression? Because I, I know that it's probably not the only thing facing women out there. This is much less common, but every now and then women will develop new onset of very serious psychiatric or mental illness, things like new onset bipolar disorder, where they have states of mania, which can be higher risk, or actually even develop postpartum psychosis, which we just talked about on episode 14 of the podcast, where people actually lose touch with reality, maybe have some hallucinations or some delusions. And that is very scary when that happens. If anyone's heard that episode, there's a whole range of ways that psychosis can manifest. Yeah, there's pretty substantial loss of touch with reality. And it can really influence people's behavior and thinking. And in the handful of really terrible outcomes related to post-birth psychosis, there can even be a risk of death, you know, in 
the infant, if those psychotic thoughts are really influencing that person's behavior in a way that's completely distorted. And so there'll be some screening typically for new mothers to ensure that there's not postpartum psychosis. And, and by death, you mean the possibility that the mother will in some way harm the child based on the psychosis that she's going through. It's very rare, but that has happened. And of course, we would never, ever want that to happen. And of course, the mother themselves doesn't want this to happen when they're in their right mind. But there can be these very serious postpartum psychosis conditions that you sometimes hear about on the news or the media that are always heartbreaking when you see them. And that's the last possible thing we would want happen. Yeah. So depression, baby blues, psychosis, bipolar, which which maybe we'll talk more about it in a upcoming episode. I think we're going to do more bipolar stuff. Um, anything else? Yes. I think the main take-home point that I would love to share that might be new information for people is to talk a little bit about a condition called postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder or postpartum OCD. Okay, so we haven't talked about OCD much. We did a little bit actually in habits, compulsions, so um, there's that episode. But how, so what, how does postpartum OCD manifest? With OCD, somebody has intrusive thoughts or even pictures in their mind that cause them to do a behavior to reduce distress associated with that. So in classic OCD, somebody might worry that their hands are contaminated by germs, whether they are or aren't, and then might wash their hands over and over again to sort of manage that fear. And this type of syndrome arising after the birth of a baby is very, very common, maybe even in, as common as in 50% of moms. And then interestingly, dads can develop this in the postpartum period too. Hmm. So what, what what does it look like then? Like what are they doing that this happens like when there's a new baby around? Right. Are they doing things with the baby, like changing the baby's diaper 100 times a day? or? Um, typically not. More often they will have a fear of the baby's health or a fear about the baby's safety. Sometimes, and this is kind of cruel when this happens, but there'll sometimes be a mental image of doing something with the baby that is horrifying. Ooh. Right. Like um, they might walk past a stairway or something and have an intrusive image of throwing the baby down the stairs, for example. Wow. And I know that's an upsetting thought just to talk about in the podcast. So I'm sorry if anybody was upset with that. But imagine being a mother and having that image jump into your head. You feel like a monster. Yeah. And uh, some women even think maybe I'm going psychotic or maybe I, I'm going to hurt my baby even though I don't want to or something like that. And it's very hard, of course, for people to talk to their doctor about that or talk to their loved ones about that because of the shame associated with verbalizing that. Yeah, I don't know what sort of screening would kind of get that out of someone. Right. The doctor's not really going to ask you if you're having thoughts about harming your baby or that would be tricky. Right. So this is one of those not often talked about things that needs to be talked about and normalized more often because of how common it is and because of how upsetting it is. What's going on is you have someone who maybe tends to be anxious or tends to be conscientious or wants to be the best parent ever. And their brain actually puts that image in their brain to say, well, that would be a terrible thing if you did that. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not reflective of an urge to do that. It's reflective of your body saying, oh, don't do that. You wouldn't want that. This isn't really the like the hand, the repeated hand washing OCD. This is something else. Well, people can then sometimes go and can do more elaborate things to reduce the likelihood of that happening again. So they might not go b past that stairway anymore, or they might lock away the knives in the kitchen or something like that, thinking that there's some kind of safety issue. Or even worse, they might hold the baby less or cuddle the baby less or feel like they should have someone else watching the child, caring for the child because they're not suited to do yeah, that. Yeah, they're protecting the baby in some way. Right. And that's the ultimate harm that comes from this condition. There's zero safety risk to the infant in these kinds of circumstances other than the problems that go along with avoiding the baby if you're worried about it. Well, that seems tricky, though, because how do you determine that it's not psychosis where there's a high risk or a right. higher risk where, versus OCD where there's no risk or little risk? Of actually harming the baby, yeah. right, actively. So that's what healthcare providers need to be trained in is differentiating those things because obviously you want to identify those high-risk situations, but you don't want to assume that every person who's had an intrusive thought like that is now psychotic because 
That's just not the case. And so we as mental health professionals are trained in differentiating an obsessive, intrusive thought versus a psychotic thought or behavior. And it's important for us to do that well because the consequences of making a mistake in either direction are high. When should someone out there actively seek out the help of a doctor? That's a great question because knowing that baby blues are so normal and intrusive thoughts are so normal, where is that line? And I would give the same answer basically that I give when we talk about mental health issues in general is that when you actually feel like you're functioning on a day-to-day basis is being hampered by these symptoms, then there is no shame in reaching out and asking for help and doing some problem solving around this. So then when someone does reach out for help, what are the treatments or what what are you going to be able to do for them? Especially if they're still pregnant, can they take all the medications that may be out there? That's a great question because I've been talking a lot here about after the baby's birth, but there's also mental health concerns that come up during pregnancy and things that happen to people during pregnancy. So it's an issue that has to take into account the wishes and the feelings of the person receiving the care. And so what we do is take things on a case-by-case basis, understand what are the risks of taking medications to treat this versus other therapies. What are the risks of not doing that? Because there's also a risk to the child having untreated mental health issues before and after birth in the mother. And so we weigh all of these risks very carefully to the extent that we are able to, based on the information we have, and make an individual decision in each case that's going to be tailored to the needs of that person. It does seem tricky because if someone has major depression and they go off their meds for their for the sake of their pregnancy. Right. And and the symptoms and everything and and then the birth, that that seems like it would be hard to walk back. If yeah. they have gone down this hole of major depression or whatever, they may be suffering even psychosis if they stop taking their antipsychotic meds. Right. There's absolutely risk to that too. So oftentimes uh, women or families feel like they are in between a rock and a hard place with these kinds of issues. That's why working closely with a mental health treatment provider to really understand the issues very closely and make some sh- shared decisions together is the most appropriate way to go about it, because this is a complicated topic. In some cases, we're also missing information on weighing risks and benefits of any treatment, because it's very hard to study pregnant women when it comes to medications or other treatments for mental health disorders. Yeah, you don't want to... You don't want to play around with someone's pregnancy too much. That's right. It's high stakes. And so we're going on limited data, but all medications are evaluated for whether they cause birth defects or those kinds of things. So most of the information we have is related to those kinds of issues. But short of that, we don't always have the information that we need to make any guarantees. And so that's why we work together on these things to understand the information that we do have access to. It sounds like the takeaway of this episode and the identification and even the treatment is just to make sure you, you know, have good conversations with your doctor, you know, disclose anything that you're feeling and be open and discuss and, and hopefully figure it out as a team. That's right. There's rarely right or clear answers when it comes to this and everybody just wants the best possible outcome and that's possible with good collaboration. Okay, great. Many of our podcast listeners are in the state of Minnesota, so I wanted to make a plug for a local resource here, a group called Pregnancy and Postpartum Support Minnesota, or PSI Minnesota. This is a group of professionals and organizations, volunteers, who offer mental health support and resources to Minnesota parents. And I'm familiar with this group and know that they are able to tailor services to meet the needs of individuals. And so I wanted to give a shout out for that. And those of you who may be in other parts of the country or the world should take steps to see if there are services in your area that might be of benefit. That sounds like a great resource. The bottom line is that if you know somebody who's struggling with reproductive or pregnancy related issues, or that's something you're experiencing yourself, or even for partners or family members who are facing challenges related to reproductive issues or childbirth in the family. There is help, and people are waiting to partner with you in healthy outcomes. It's all about the healthy outcomes. That's right. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us today. This podcast was produced by Kaz and George. Music by Paul. He's the best. Contact us and send us your questions on Twitter at Mind Deconstructed.